Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Andre Freiner, and I'm glad to be introducing Dr. Lynn Shannon, our first keynote speaker today. Dr. Lynn Shannon uh, is a marine researcher in the Department of Biological Science at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, co-leading the Marine Ecology and Fisheries Laboratory. She has over 20 years experience undertaking ecological research and modeling to contribute to ecosystem-based modeling and management. She has constructed traffic models in the Bengal upwelling region to provide an understanding of structure, functioning, and change in these marine food webs, largely in response to fishing and climate. Dr. Shannon co-chairs the International Working Group Indices, evaluating effects of fishing and natural variability on marine ecosystems. Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce, introduce Dr. Lynn Shannon. Good morning, everybody. Oh, I need to stand here. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, is this working? Okay. Um, it's my real pleasure to be here today, and before I begin, I'd really like to give heartfelt thanks to the organizers for being so patient with me in all my delays and all my <laughs> practicalities, um, and I'm really delighted to be here. I'm going to be speaking to you about the combined effects of fishing and environmental variability on our marine ecosystems. So, navigating an ocean under stress. The question is, that we'll be looking at today is who's doing that navigating. We don't just have a vacant, um, luckily, a bridge of a ship going into nowhere. We have a whole team of people doing amazing work, and that's what I'm going to be touching on today. Um, what are we navigating through? Stormy seas, it seems, but there is some hope, and that message of hope is what we'll be getting to at the end of this talk. So what we, will, what we do need for this whole um, voyage is a sturdy ship equipped with um, the necessary tools, and um, a diverse navigational crew. A team of people with diverse skills who can really answer and grapple with the questions we're asking and help provide our managers with the information they need. Multiple drivers of marine ecosystems has been a topic that's been recently addressed in a chapter um, of the Intergovernmental um, Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IPBES. And um, we've recently just released our, well, the very first global biodiversity assessment. And one of the chapters dealt with um, direct and indirect drivers. So there are five direct drivers, um, changes in land, land and sea use, direct exploitation, which would in include obviously fisheries in our case, climate change, with all of the um, implications thereof, pollution, and then the fifth main um, direct driver is invasive alien species. So how are these drivers changing? Well, from the global assessment report, um, we noted that direct and indirect drivers um, of change in our nature and our biodiversity have accelerated during the past 50 years. And in marine ecosystems, direct exploitation is having the biggest effect on our nature and on the um, services that it can provide to our people, our contributions to people is what we call it. Climate change is a direct driver which is exacerbating the negative effects of all the other um, drivers. Um, and these effects are accelerating in recent years. And these changes have all contributed to the changes in biodiversity that we're seeing, changes in the distribution of our um, fish species, changes in phenology of our species, that is the seasonal um, life history traits, um, changes in population dynamics, in um, the community structure, and in the way the ecosystem's functioning. And the confounding effects of these drivers are likely to exacerbate the negative effects of these drivers on nature. So just to, to recap in terms of what's important for the ocean, fishing, as I said, has had the, most, um, the, the strongest impact on our marine um, biodiversity, on our ecosystems. And then climate change is projected to have acceleratingly important um, impacts. And um, the um, IPBES um, team that looked at scenarios showed that uh, meeting the sustainable development goals and the um, 
2050 vision for biodiversity um, will depend on us taking into account the effects of climate change when we plan for our, um, when we set our, our objectives, our management objectives, and our future goals. So it's going to be really important that we know how climate change is affecting our ecosystems in combination with what we're doing to those ecosystems, and for us that's fishing. So what I've done today is, um, well for today, is selected three key papers that I wanted to um, highlight as examples of really exciting work that's been looking at trying to um, disaggregate or dis, um, kind of take out the effects of fishing versus climate and then what are those two doing together in our ecosystems. So the papers that um, we'll be looking at are um, by Morgan Travers, um, and she looked at using an OSMOS model, a size-based model, um, on, and looking at fishing and, and upwelling. And then Kelly Ortega, who we have the pleasure of having in our audience today, hi Kelly, um, has, look, has used the Atlantis model to um, do some very smart things on um, how climate and fishing are interacting in the Southern Manguela. And then I want to um, just present a little bit from Ke Hong Fu, who has taken the indices, the indicators for the seas work that we've been doing, um, using a number of different models to look at fishing effects um, under environmental variability. So what we'll be doing, um, because I'm from South Africa, um, is focusing on that system as an example of, of, how, of, of, of how these different approaches are being applied and have been used. So you can see um, here's Namibia, South Africa, here's Cape Town, which is proving exceptionally difficult to leave because we just get stuck there and our flights get delayed. But, um, and here I just put in um, something to remind you that we have a really complicated food web that we're dealing with. We have an upwelling system on the west coast and we have um, a shelf system on the south coast. Um, and this makes things even more complicated. So, just to set the scene, the South African catches have been changing over time. This plot is for 1978 to 2015, and you can see in particular the yellow and green um, parts, which are our anchovy and sardine, have been fluctuating fairly dramatically, and they account for most of our catches in terms of quantity. What I've done here is just taken out a very simple... Um, just put a very simple slide together, summing, purely summing the relative fishing effort of a number of different fleets that are put together for our ecosystem food web model fitting, um, just to show you that fishing effort in total, um, um, if you add up each fleet and give them equal weighting, has been really declining um, over time. But the fishing effects have not, not necessarily been so. Then we have um, very, very much... Um, very obvious changes within our environment. And these are specifically, given an upwelling system that we're in, um, visible in the cumulative upwelling index, which Taryn Lamont has um, very cleverly been working on and has produced many time series for us on this. And you can see that from 1996 onwards, we have had an elevated level of um, cumulative upwelling in our region. This is having um, large implications for our pelagic fish and for the whole ecosystem. So on to our first um, case study, uh, Morgan Travis. She looked at um, the Benguela um, by, in, by using an end-to-end -end ecosystem model, which was based on a hydrographic model. Um, the, ROMS model linked to an NPZD squared <laughs> um, biogeochemical model, and then feeding in and coupled to a size-based pelagic, well, not pelagic fish, size-based fish model um, with a limited number of fish species, but very well documented. And she looked at scenarios of, of altered wind stress um, as a measure of altered um, upwelling, obviously. So the wind stress will drive the upwelling, which is really important in, um, in our system. And then looking at scenarios of increased fishing on the high trophic level species. So she looked at snook, hake, and cob. Those were the main species within the um, Osmos model that she then um, tested scenarios of, of increased fishing on them. 
And then she had a look at the additive, the synergistic, and the antagonistic, or the dampened, rather dampened effects within the system. And now what I'm going to do for the next three case studies is give you a simplification of what, just so you can visually um, grasp what's actually going on. Because everyone's chosen to represent things slightly differently, and the way they plot things is different. And when I was trying to put it in, into this talk, I got myself so confused I had to reread the papers a million times. So I'm going to call this a linification, a simplification according to Lin. So what we have is we have fishing in green and climate in yellow and the combined effect in orange. Now, hypothetically imagine that this is, for example, that um, this is representing the impact of fishing and climate on our sardine. And um, the effect is a factor of five, for example. So we would have um, where's my a factor of five. We'd have fishing, we'd have climate, and if you add those two effects together, you'd simply get 10, which is where this line is, and so we say, well, that is just simply an additive cumul cumulative effect. If, however, we added them and we got a bigger cumulative effect, something bigger than 10, we call that synergistic. And then for dampened, we would have an effect that would be less than the sum of the two effects. Okay. So, Morgan has modeled um, all the different groups of, of um, the, the feeding gills within her, her um, ecosystem. And here I'm showing you the small pelagic fish um, representation where you can see the wind multiplier, which is driving our upwelling, increasing here and the fish multiplier, which is um, increasing fishing on our top predatory fish, as both of those increase, the small pelagic fish, which is shown in this graph, their biomass increases, so it's beneficial for both of them. And conversely, low fishing mortality on large pelagics and large fish, and low productivity means that we have reduced biomass of our small pelagics, and our small fish. So this is a graph that you'll be seeing um, again in, in another study later on. But basically what it's showing, it's plotting the cumulative effects on the y-axis and the sum of the separate effects on the x-axis. And that, that one line, one one line, would be what, they would, what you would get if you had additive effects. Purely 5 and 5 is 10. And what, what we're seeing here in the circles, each circle is a scenario where the bottom half of the circle represents the bottom up forcing function, the bottom-up effects of um, increased upwelling. The um, filled black circle would be um, a positive effect, so increase in upwelling. And then the top circle, the top half circle, represents fishing, top-down effects on high trophic level species. Um, the black would be a positive, if, a positive effect, which would mean we would be reducing fishing. So that's just to give you um, an idea of what all these, all these different dots are. They're the different scenarios. And you can see that for small pelagic, well, for small fish, which are, are largely small pelagic fish in our system, that under the combined effect of fishing on high trophic levels and um, increased upwelling, we have dampened effects in the system. We have effects falling below our additive line. Okay. So now we go on to Kelly Ortega's um, very nice paper, a very thorough paper, looking at climate change effects in the southern Anguilla using the Atlantis model. And um, she used the Nima Medusa um, 2 model to um, generate climate scenarios, um, warming scenarios, and the ones that I'm going to focus on today are the RCP 2.6 and um, 8.5 scenarios that she's, she's been working on into the model. But before we do that, we need a linification. So we have additive effects, 5 and 5 is 10. Synergistic, 5 and 5 is more than 10. Dampened, 5 and 5 is less than 10. And then we have here negatively antagonistic. So we would have a positive effect for fishing, plus 5 on some group, a negative effect of climate, minus 5 for a group. But overall, these don't cancel one another. We're still getting a, a combined negative effect, so we have negative antagonism. Okay, so what Kelly has plotted here is the response ratio of different um, <coughs> key functional groups within our ecosystem, so small pelagics all the way to zooplankton, and the um, clear bar is the fishing effect, and you can see that it's positive for some groups, specifically small pelagics, 
um, and mesopelagics. And this is because it was, what she was doing was modeling um, fishing, um, continued fishing at 2015 levels um, over time. And so we were still fishing the higher trophic levels. And this was obviously beneficial for the smaller um, forage fish because their predatory, um, the predatory effects of the high trophic levels were being somewhat removed by fishing. But in all cases, the, um, the scenarios of just warming, RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5 of the IPPC scenarios, resulted in a decline in the small pelagic um, biomass, but also in the biomass of all the other groups. And also what we were seeing is that when we have combined effects of, of these warming scenarios, the, the gray and the black um, bars, together with fishing, we had even stronger um, negative effects in many cases. So what she did is she looked at the interaction effect, which is the difference between the um, effect of fishing and warming combined versus just the warming, um, and the effect of um, fishing versus no fishing, and she calculated the interaction effect. And what we have here is everything above this. So on the line, we have what we, would, what we were talking about in terms of additive effects. They add together, and they're simply additive effects. So for round herring, our red eye round herring, and for seabirds and seals, we're having simple additive effects coming out um, within the southern Manguela. Under um, our fishing strategy currently, um, under the new warming scenarios. But we have synergistic effects for a lot of our larger pelagic um, fish predators and our large demersal species. So those are the ones above the, the zero line there. And then we have negative, and well, we don't it's not necessarily negative, but antagonistic effects, so negative interaction effects, antagonistic effects for our small pelagics um, because the fishing was having a positive effect overall on those groups, whereas warming was having a negative effect. So this is a way of representing what's actually happening within the ecosystem in terms of how these effects are propagating through our food web. Okay, so now we go on to Kehong Fu, who has put together um, a huge number of analyses based on millions and trillions of simulations which the Indices Working Group um, undertook. And what we did is we used four different kinds of ecosystem models in nine different ecosystems, and we tested um, the effects of increased, directionally increased prime production um, and increasing fishing on either high trophic level species or low trophic level species or across all species that were commercially exploitable within an ecosystem. And she had a look at trying to disentangle those effects. Okay, so you've seen this, this plot before. Um, what she specifically was looking at in this study was the, the sign, the, 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 the direction of the change. Was it positive or negative? And what she was trying to do here was look at everything below this line, which she classified as ecologically um, risky. Not good for our ecosystem. Right, so alinification again. So we have our um, additive effects, our synergistic effects, negative synergism, so minus minus comes out at bigger than the sum of those negatives. Um, positively dampened effects, negatively dampened effects, and then she looked at positive and negative antagonism. So a positive fishing effect, a negative climate effect came out as an overall negative. Um, or a positive um, fishing, negative climate came out as a positive overall effect. So a little bit more um, detail in this study. Um, here we have the, um, intensif the in, um, intensity of the combined effects, and so you can see across the nine different models um, and across the different um, fishing strategies which we have across here. So we're going to zoom in onto the southern Manguela again and um, have a look what's happening. So these are the fishing strategies, low trophic level, high trophic level, and all, um, all fisheries. And what you see in the red and um, yellow and green bars are the risky scenarios. So those are the, um, the negative antagonism, the positively dampened, and the negative 
um, synergistic, those below that one um, line in the graph. And you can see that for um, low trophic level fisheries, um, in combination with um, changes in primary production, we are having the riskiest um, of scenarios. Okay, so that's quite important to remember that um, for managers to note that um, if they are changing their, um, when they're managing their low trophic level fisheries, they need to be very careful because the effects under our, our changing climate are going to be exacerbated, um, more negative than they would be. Okay. So what are the implications of these changing drivers for our marine ecosystems? So environmental change can act at many different trophic levels, um, and it acts in combination with um, fishing, it acts in combination, well, in, in within a food web that has its own internal dynamics, its own predator-prey um, interactions going on. And overall, it causes changes in the structure of our, our ecosystem and sometimes also the way in which that ecosystem is functioning. So, in South Africa, we've had geographical changes, geographical shifts um, in our forage fish, in our anchovy and sardine in particular. And what we've seen is that there's been a shift from the west coast, um, sardine and anchovy um, on the west coast, um, and that is the pink is for the earlier years, 1984 to 1988. Um, and then we have now in the, well, in the 2003 to 2008 period plotted here, the kind of the orange, which is much more on the south and east coast, and then looking up areas at, at areas of overlap. So you can see that things have really shifted, and this has, got, has had huge implications for the predators that are preying um, on these species. So this is just another plot looking at the um, proportion of, or the percentage of biomass from our acoustic surveys of anchovy and sardine that's found east and west of Cape Agulhas, the tip of Africa, east and west. And you can see that there's a much larger proportion now um, on the east. So, as I said, this has had major implications for our predatory um, species, and not, not the least of which are um, many of our seabirds, of which many of these are endangered, so the consequences are really dire. Um, what I'm showing you here is a model, um, an ecosystem model, where we've been trying to fit our observed, um, we're trying to fit the model to our observations of abundance and catches um, using some of our environmental series that I mentioned earlier, the cumulative upwinding index, for example. And what we found is that if we reduce the availability of large sardine to our penguins and to our gannets, after 1998 or so, the model was fitting much better. So there's something happening within that system, um, not only just geographical distribution, but also distribution of the fish within the water column. And so we're busy examining that together with some of the seabird biologists and going more into the spatial dynamics thereof. So how can we communicate this complicated information to our decision makers so that they can actually make informed decisions and do something constructive with all of this? I mean, we're giving them a lot of information, but what can they actually take out of it as a warning sign? What can they do with it? How can we give them information that they can do, that they can really use? So the Indexes project, Indicators for the Seas, specifically focused, um, or focuses on um, presenting the effects of fishing under climate, under different scenarios of, of, of human, um, human di dimensions, um, for stakeholders, for managers, so that they can actually see, uh, so they can actually use this information. Um, we're trying to disseminate that information. So to do that, we used indicators. So what we were doing is we were looking at the drivers, the indirect drivers, management and governance, and the direct driver being fishing there your other driver being um, climate and environmental variability, and disseminating that information, um, putting it, synthesizing it into um, decision trees and into um, information that managers can actually get their hands on. So, excuse me. So, what we were looking at is fisheries-based indicators, um, indicators from models, indicators from um, surveys. Um, the Indices Project specifically focused on survey-based indicators. And then some studies 
which can look at fishing and climate together using um, both observational and modeling data. And we looked at a whole lot of different indicators across many different ecosystems. What are they doing over time? We had different ways of looking at the trends over time. Um, and we had um, different sets of, of these indicators and we looked at how these performed. But that's a whole talk on its own. What one of my students, Wazal Osman, um, did is she took the um, ecosystem models, ecopath models, um, of the Southern Manguela, and she took the indicators from these and tried to look at putting these into decision trees to, um, to assess what was happening within that ecosystem in that different time period. And so I've just picked out um, one of these decision trees here, and then she put it together for the pelagic fishing community and asked the question, well, what trend is the pelagic or the demersal form at that matter, community showing. Um, the first question would be, what is the pelagic biomass trend doing within that time period when it's examining? Is it increasing, is it staying the same, or is it decreasing? So if it was increasing, the next question, um, what, what is the trend in terms of the fishing pressure, the pelagic catch over biomass, what is that showing? Is it increasing? If so, then the system's not necessarily improving, even though our biomass is improving. And so you'll see that that's the kind of reasoning, and she had a whole expert system that she built for this with all kinds of explanations for the, for the stakeholders, for the managers, as to why one would come up with the various conclusions. She put these together into an entire ecosystem assessment status. So it's a kind of thing that we can look at. I wanted to go on now to unraveling um, climate effects, also using decision trees. Um, and this is work by um, one of my students um, and now postdoc, Emma Lockerbie. And she took the ecological um, indicators, um, trends in each of these indicators, and she looked at the significance of the trends. And then she looked at fishing pressure. And she asked the question, well, she had some indicators of fishing pressure, and she asked the question, well, how or to what extent is the change in fishing pressure we observe within that specific um, time period, to what extent is that explaining the trend in the indicators that we're observing? And depending on the answer to that, and she had a whole lot of um, supporting information for that, um, one would then change the score that she was giving, attributing to each of these indicators, um, depending on whether they were significantly positive or significantly negative, she would then amend that score. So if fishing was playing a role, she would increase that score, to in increase the um, importance of fishing within our assessment here. And then similarly, she would downplay the score given to each of the indicators if the environment was seen to be, if the environmental indicators were showing changes that were affecting what we were seeing within the ecological indicators. And then eventually she would come out with an ecosystem status assessment. Is the ecosystem in that specific period being examined improving, deteriorating, possibly improving, possibly deteriorating? And she's applied this to a number of different ecosystems very successfully. So this is just um, a snapshot to give you an idea of, of the kind of work that she was doing. You can always go and read some of her papers. Um, basically, here we have our uh, mean length, mean lifespan, survey biomass, proportion of predatory fish within the ecosystem, and trophic level of the survey community. And then each of those are given a score depending on the trend that was observed. Um, this one, mean length, gets a five, which is negative, which means it was significantly negatively declining over that time period. Um, by comparison, trophic level of the survey community was significantly um, improving over that time period. And then she asked the question, as I said, um, what, uh, what was the fishing um, pressure doing in that time period? What was more or less staying the same? But given that, what, how, much, um, was, how much importance was fishing playing in, term, in, in, in what we were actually seeing in these ecological indicators? She would change those scores, do the same for the environment. And she would come out with an assessment. In this case, for 2004 to 2010 in the Southern Manguela, she concluded that we were in a state of possibly improving. Okay, so this is really a way of bringing information together into an ecosystem assessment. And she's taken into account the fishing driver and she's taken into account the environmental drivers in a quantitative way, but in a way that synthesizes things. 
So what we've been doing um, recently for a paper that's, um, that's just almost in press, hopefully, um, is modeling fishing scenarios under increased primary production. And so what we did is we had a look at how primary production is changing. So upwelling is changing the levels of primary production and within the ecosystem model, we can, we can input that in terms of what's changing in terms of our primary production on our large um, phytoplankton. So we could imagine that over the next 10 years, we could have as much as a doubling of our primary production. So that's what um, we've modeled here. Um, in those years is a doubling, and therefore what happens to all the different functional groups within our ecosystem model in that time period. And then having done that, we went in and we looked at, well, given those big increases over time in many of the different groups that we're seeing, what could we do, um, hypothetically, could we, take, uh, could we increase fishing on um, low trophic level species, prey species, could we increase fishing on the predators, could we increase fishing on all of the groups in the um, proportion to which we are seeing those observed changes um, if we simulate into the future at current fishing pressure levels. So this was really an exploratory um, piece of work, looking at testing the concept of this decision tree kind of approach um, in a dynamic simulation um, framework. So what I picked out here just to show you was that in the scenario of increased fishing um, on predators and prey, given, given the ratios in which these would increase over the simulation period in response to our increased primary production, we were finding that biomass, model biomass would be improving, but things like proportion of predatory fish and trophic level of the, of the model community were both decreasing. And given she applied this whole um, decision tree framework, and um, concluded that this scenario may lead to an ecosystem that would possibly be deteriorating. But alternatively, she had a look at just what, what happens if we just increased our fishing on our, our prey species, and that she came out with an ecosystem with, um, given increased primary production, um, we could actually probably fish more on our prey species and still have an ecosystem that may be um, doing its thing fairly well. Um, what she did after this is she then looked at the um, end points, the last kind of 10 years of simulation, and she used ANOVAS to look at how a number of different indicators change, but that's also a subject for a, a different talk. But just to give you a flavor for the kinds of things that, that one can do um, with indicators and with our model scenarios of what's happening. So there are rough seas ahead. We've seen that the situation is looking quite bleak um, in many places in the world. And the IPBES the best Global Assessment um, Media Report um, from May 2019 in Paris quoted um, Sir Bob Watson, who was our, our chair, as saying, the health of ecosystems on which we and all other species depend is deteriorating more rapidly than ever. We are eroding the very foundations of our economies, our livelihoods, our food security, our health, and the quality of life worldwide. Now, these are serious words. Um, they really are worrying. He said the report also tells us that it is not too late to make a difference, but only if we start now at every level from local to global. Through transformative change, Nature can still be conserved, can be restored, and it can be sustainably used. This is also key to meeting most of our other global goals. By transformative change, we mean a fundamental system-wide reorganization across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values. So these are really serious words, very thought-provoking words, and very are yeah, very sobering thoughts. So my personal plea today is for, for your help, for more research, um, looking at new ways of detecting and tracking our changes in marine ecosystems, looking at what drivers are causing um, what changes, how are these effects being confounded, how are they coming together to actually 
to actually change the world in which we live, the ocean in which we live. We need new ways of disseminating this information for managers. Um, we need to be able to say to the managers, these are, this is what the likelihood is of combined effects of our human use of an ecosystem under our current climate change regimes, and these are the things you need to look at. This is what's important. And then obviously we need increased effort into uh, mitigating factors, mitigating for these changes. So we, we all have a role to play um, in this, this process. We are doing the navigating. We're doing the navigating through very rough seas and through a, a, with a very bleak landscape, very bleak horizon. But we are doing the navigating and we are very well equipped. We have, um, we have a sturdy ship. We have a huge amount of um, very intelligent people with lots of innovation. Um, we have amazingly exciting technologies um, and analyses and methods to look at things. Um, and so, we, we really can make a difference and, we, and we're getting there. And I think what I wanted to just say today is, is I just wanted to extend the invitation to jump on board, um, don't jump ship, jump on board, join our, our diverse navigational crew, um, and let's try and get to the, to the bottom of this, to the grips of it, so we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for such inspiring and clear presentation. We have no time for, for questions. The microphone's there. Hello. Lynn, it's Mike Roberts here. Hello. Very nice talk. <laughs> you got I out think. of Cape Town too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, great talk, and I think you summarized it beautifully. Um, but the begging question in my mind is, so you have an incredible amount of information on the fisheries, how the ecosystems are being affected. What's the appetite by management? You're starting to go into that political zone. A lot of the managers aren't scientists. Yes. They're making really important decisions, and yes, they have the pressures of trying to balance the socioeconomics, the politics. But in the South African situation, is this information being taken seriously in the working groups that manage these fisheries? Thanks, Mike, for that question. I'm going to try and be politically correct in my answer. <laughs> Mike and I go back a long way. Um, yes, it is being taken seriously. It's been taken more seriously in working groups dealing with um, the kind of non-consumptive uses of our system. So it's been taken um, very seriously in our top predator working groups, um, in, in our CBO technical task teams, for example. It's been recognized to a certain extent in many of our fisheries working groups, and they like to say we're doing the ecosystem approach, and of course we're considering it. But when it gets to the nitty gritty, you've touched uh, the nail on the head, Mike, they're not able to incorporate it into their current operational management procedures. We don't have enough, um, we don't have enough quantitative statistical rigor to what we're trying to do um, to satisfy them in terms of the processes that they're, the approaches they're using at the moment. So we can give them information and they say that's very interesting, but um, it's difficult to, to kind of link what we're doing with what um, the single stock managers are doing. Um, so I think that there's a willingness from most of them um, to recognize that the ecosystem is important and what we, you know, the climate effects are important. But in terms of actually taking that information up, I mean, we, we, we prepare um, status of the environment reports, status of the ecosystem reports, we prepare all kinds of things. But in terms of actually being taken up, there's still a big challenge there. Um, and I'm hoping within the South African situation that this will improve because we just had elections, as some of you will know. Um, and our environmental department is now going to be merging again with our fisheries department. So there should be a little bit more um, structure and better flow of information than there has been in the last decade or so. so. More questions? I see a hand here.
Hi, Lynn. Um, Hi, thanks Lynn. for your interesting update um, from the Benguela. And just sort of interested in um, some of the broader messages we can take from your talk. And my question is sort of about the issue that we're facing a number of fishy, fisheries about sort of separating the effects of fishing and climate, which you talked a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> my question is about what we should do with that information or, or you know, what, what the objectives are. And so there's no, there's no wrong or right answer to my question. I'm just interested in your views. So take your example of a stock that's declining due to climate. Do you think the objectives should be that, you know, A, we, we drastically reduce fishing to um, give that stock as best a chance as possible? Or, you know, B, do we fish it as hard as possible because we go, well, it's declining anyway? Or C, do we say, well, we're going to, which is what we're trying to do in some places, we're going to dynamically modify our calculations on what the sustainable yield is. So we keep fishing it um, sustainably depending on what's happening in the environment, but of course we're tracking down. I mean, it's obviously, it's not an easy question and mm. I've simplified it. I mean, your, your mm. answer might be that it's more complicated and we need a portfolio approach where we look at well, what's happening to all the species and we need the ecosystem models to say, change your whole way of fishing. But any perspectives around that and sort of how we actually use that information going into management, I'd be interested in. Thanks, Eva. I think you summarized it really nicely and I would say somewhere between A and C. Um, and I think that's what really what um, Emma and I were trying to do with the recent paper that we were looking at is trying to say, well, things are gonna change um, under our climate scenarios, but it need not necessarily be to the detriment of all our fisheries. So I think here modeling can play quite a big role. Um, and obviously one would need to then have maybe a, a number of different models, different ecosystem models looking at the same questions so that one can get a, a range of, of, um, of feasible outcomes. Um, but, but really just looking at what can we imaginatively do um, to still use the um, fish, fisheries within our ecosystems, but without collapsing everything. Um, and so I think that's where we were getting at, where we were looking at, well, if we, um, if we try to um, fish our predator and our prey stocks at the um, levels that would be, um, would be optimal, given what they're likely biomass trajectories will be under the given climate scenario, um, we may have a deteriorating ecosystem. Um, maybe that's not such a good thing. Um, but if we just, if we left our, our, for example, I'm just using hypothetical case, but if, for example, what we did is we just left the fishing of the high trophic level species at kind of current fishing mortalities, um, didn't increase, so we weren't gonna take um, advantage there necessarily of the possible increase in this scenario we were modeling with increased prime production. This wasn't a warming scenario. Um, it was a cooling scenario, but um, then we could maybe take more of our, our forage fish out, and so those fisheries we could probably increase, um, and it wouldn't necessarily collapse our entire ecosystem. So we were looking at seabirds, we were looking at, so I think that's really just the, it was the thinking we were trying to put across um, in this paper, um, and I think that would, that's kind of where I'm coming from, which is why we did the paper how we, how we did. Um, a little bit, thinking a little bit more out of the box um, and a little bit more holistically than we are thinking at the moment, but not just closing everything for the sake of, you know, we can't keep the system how it is. It's going to change. That's, that's a reality. So, yeah, I hope that, yeah. Well, unfortunately, we, we have to stop here, but uh, I see some hands uh, being raised, but uh, Dr. Lin Shen will be, will be here the whole week, so you're more than welcome to, to ask her, I hope. <laughs> and thanks so much for your presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you.